in most of the church world this morning, they are celebrating Palm Sunday, despite the fact that there is no actual biblical historical evidence for the idea that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a Sunday. But it works conveniently on the Roman church calendar to make it Palm Sunday. So we're going to take a couple minutes this morning and talk about Palm Sunday, and then we'll continue where we were in Acts 23. But this is another one of those examples where, as Jesus said to the Pharisees, you have made the word of God of no effect by your tradition. This is another place where tradition has kicked in and created this very attractive idea of Palm Sunday. I know pastors in, the, uh, in, in my own circle who have been criticized for not preaching about Palm Sunday because people really love the idea of there being a particular Sunday where Jesus rode into Jerusalem and they laid palm branches and clothes in the street. That happened. Jesus' triumphal entry happened. Jesus being lauded as the son of David, that happened. And because John 12 tells us specifically that six days before Passover, Jesus was in Bethany, and on the next day he rode in for the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that makes it five days, the triumphal entry, five days before the Passover. Well, because the tradition of the church has long been that Jesus died on a Friday, no, he didn't. <laughs> but because they give you the impression he died on a Friday, if you count five days backwards from Friday, you end up on a Sunday. Now, if you think logically, if he in fact rode into Jerusalem on a Sunday, the day before the triumphal entry would be a Saturday, which would make it a Sabbath day. And there are a lot of Sabbath rules involved on a Saturday. So let's take a look at John 12 for just a moment and see whether the events that took place in Mary and Martha's house in Bethany could have happened on a Saturday. Because if they couldn't, then there's no way the triumphal entry happened on a Sunday. You understand my logic here? Because again, I'm a text wonk. I'm all about what does the Bible say? And wherever the Bible and your traditions bump into each other, one of you is wrong. And the Bible I'm going to continue to say is right, and your traditions are what's wrong. So we're going to start in John 12 for a moment here and see if we can unravel this Palm Sunday thing. While you're flipping there, I have to tell you a funny story. When I used to live in Detroit back in my high school and college days, I had a lot of friends that were Catholic. Very high concentration of Catholic population in the Detroit area. And so I was at one of my friend's houses on Palm Sunday, and they came home with palm branches, which they then displayed on their fireplace. A lot of people nodding. They remember going to churches, and you get a palm branch. So they had laid the palm branch on the mantle by their fireplace, and my friend had a little sister that couldn't have been more than three, Amy. I can't believe I remember her name. Little Amy walked over and took a hold of the palm branch, and her mother flipped out and screamed through the house, don't touch that, it's holy! <gasps> and the little girl let go of it, screamed bloody murder, and ran through the house. <laughs> and there she went. Don't touch that, it's holy. And I remember being a Lutheran kid at the time, being part of the Protestant portion of Detroit, I remember thinking, boy, what a frightening thing she just did to her daughter, because she has really imposed on her daughter's conscience this idea of don't touch things that are holy, and then someday they're going to say to her, hey, the Holy Ghost is going to come and inhabit you. And she's going to go, holy, no, and freak out and run. No, don't touch anything that's holy. Palm branches in Jerusalem, when Jesus rode in, were pulled off trees and laid down on the ground to signify that he was a king riding in. That's why they laid their robes on the street. It's not that these things were blessed by a priest or a pope somewhere and therefore were untouchable. These were very common things that were laid in the street as a way of saying a king is entering into Jerusalem. But as often happens in the traditions of religion, they take these very basic, very common things, and raise them up to high, holy, liturgical things until they are unapproachable, untouchable, unassailable. Next week, we're going to take the Lord's Supper, and one more time, I'm going to bring it down here to street level where we live, 
because when Jesus implemented, when he took the Passover with his apostles and said, do this in remembrance of me, he didn't turn it into a high liturgical practice. He didn't close off the common people by a gate and say, I'm up here at the altar, put your tongue out and I'll put some bread on your tongue. It was in fact a very communal, very familial, very practical, very friendly thing that was done there, as the Passover supper always was. It was something that families did. They got together in their homes and they took that supper to remember God's deliverance. So in so much of my ministry, I've tried to say, take these, these very liturgical white tower things and bring them back down where we live. Bring them back down into the dust and the stuff and the shoe leather of life so that we can understand them the way they were originally understood. And this idea of holy things simply isn't in the text. And either is, by the way, Sunday. So let's go look. Chapter 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Now, whenever the Passover was, we know that six days before that, he was in Bethany. But if the next day, the triumphal entry, is a Sunday, then he came to Bethany on a Saturday, which means he came to Bethany on a Sabbath day. Now, first we have to ask whether Jesus would make that kind of trip on the Sabbath. Knowing what all the Sabbath rules were about travel, would Jesus have made that kind of trip into Bethany? Even if we're going to allow that he did, because he is the one, after all, who did pick corn on the Sabbath. He is the one who healed on the Sabbath. He is the one who argued that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So maybe we could say, okay, Jesus made the trip on a Sabbath day. But in a moment, we're going to see that Jews from Jerusalem also came to Bethany, to Mary and Martha's house on this very day. Now, geographically, where Jerusalem's concerned, just outside the city wall, there is the Mount of Olives. In Acts 1, it's very specific to tell us that the Mount of Olives was a particular distance from Jerusalem. Do you remember what the phrase is? It is a Sabbath day journey from Jerusalem. In other words, the distance you were allowed to travel on a Sabbath day. So the Mount of Olives was within the distance that a Jew could travel from Jerusalem on a Sabbath day. Got that picture? Bethany, four times as far which means any Jew who traveled from Jerusalem to Bethany on the Sabbath day clearly and obviously broke the Sabbath. Now the question is, would the Jews, the very ones who had already condemned Jesus for breaking the Sabbath, would they go all the way to Bethany on the Sabbath day to a house they knew Jesus was in, who they've already condemned for breaking the Sabbath? Because that's exactly what takes place here. And of course you're all shaking your heads. No, there's just no way that Jews who are supposed to be serving in the temple on the Sabbath or staying in their homes who can't travel further than the Mount of Olives, there's no way they're going to travel all the way to Bethany on a Sabbath day to see Jesus who they've already accused of breaking the Sabbath. That's not going to happen, and yet it's exactly what the text says happened. So, Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bore what was put therein. And then Jesus said, let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor you always have with you, but me you do not always have. Much people, look at verse 9. Much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there. Now think this through logically. What day did he get there? That very day, it says at the beginning of the chapter. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. So he came to Bethany that very day. That very day, the people of the Jews heard he was there. Much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there.